Okay, chapter two, plate tectonics. So, um, as I said in the uh, previous lecture uh, on chapter one, the way plate tectonics works is going to be an issue where you need to understand plate tectonics, understand parts of the rock cycle and some of the other things we're going to be discussing throughout the semester. And you need to understand those items to understand some of plate tectonics. So we're going to kind of get an introduction of it here. And in a few chapters, we will then cover it again um, in a little more detail. So to start with, uh, plate tectonics really began as an idea from a gentleman named Alfred Wegener in uh, 1915. Uh, Wegener was a climatologist who was stationed in the Arctic for a number of years and his observations of what he saw in the Arctic and the way ice moved over the ocean surface got him thinking about the continents and what he observed is that the continents are moving. Now he observed this not by directly watching the continents move but by finding evidence of that and he published his ideas in a book in 1915 called The Origin of Continents and Oceans. Um, his hypothesis began with the idea of a supercontinent. Um, a supercontinent is a term we use in geology for most of the, if not all of the land masses, the continents merge into one body. Um, Wegener called this supercontinent Pangaea for ancient Greek for all earth. He uh, per proposed that about 200 million years ago it began to break apart. Now, he looked at this and he said the continents then drifted into their current positions, hence the name continental drift. Now, he had some evidence to support this, evidence that other people had pointed to previously saying that there was something going on with the continents. Uh, one of the things is the most common thing most people see when they look at the continents, which is the fact that, well, gee, if you take South America and move it over, it f fits like a jigsaw puzzle piece into Africa. Um, that was one big... And now that was looking at the shorelines. Today we look at what's called the edge of the continental shelf and we see the fit is even better than we thought before. Um, he also looked at fossil evidence, uh, specifically two fossils um, in particular, one called a, a Mesosaurus, which was a small sea going lizard, um, only about a foot and a half, two feet long. And uh, it's found on either side of the Atlantic. Now, something that's small, it's cold-blooded, crossing the entire Atlantic Ocean, which, it, which is relatively large today, is a little unheard of. Um, but the other thing that was even more convincing was the, a fossil plant called Glossopteris. And Glossopteris is a, a, akin to what today we would call a modern cycad. And uh, it was known for a large seed that it had, but, you know, unlike seeds today, the only seed that we have that can cross the ocean for any distance is the coconut, and even it can only go a certain distance before the seawater uh, causes the coconut to sink by absorption, and then basically the, the nut is no longer, any, no longer valid. So he had those. Um, he also had rock types. Now this was a really powerful, and it's even more powerful today. There are rocks on the east coast of South America that look identical to the rocks on the west coast of Africa. Um, in fact, today we actually know that through the process of geochemistry that these rocks are not only looking identical, they are chemically identical. And that's very, very powerful evidence, especially since these are basaltic rocks or volcanic rocks. It's highly unusual to find two volcanic rocks that have the same chemistry that come from different volcanic locations. Usually when you find a set of volcanic rocks that have the same chemistry, they came from the same source material. So this means that the volcanic rocks had to have come from the same source material, even though they're now separated by the thousands of miles of the Atlantic Ocean. 
And then finally, he had what we call paleoclimate evidence. This is evidence uh, from the climate of the Earth, past climate of the Earth, which is recorded in sedimentary rocks. Specifically, glacial evidence. We have evidence of glaciers near the equator, whereas we have evidence of temperate to tropical swamplands at much higher latitudes than we would find them today. So this was evidence that something was going on, something was moving and causing uh, these different continents to move into areas that could support these climates rather than the world going some very wild and weird climate shifts where for some reason the Arctic is following the equator and the tropics are at the poles at the same time. Now, unfortunately, for Wegener's hypothesis, he had a problem. And that problem was the inability to provide a mechanism. What was going to push these continents or cause these continents to move across the surface of the Earth? Wegener tried to answer this to his credit. Um, he came up with the idea that maybe it was tidal forces, tidal influences that were strong enough to cause the continents to move. but. It was then calculated out that if tidal, if tidal forces were that strong, they would basically stop the Earth's rotation. And that's not going to work. Uh, he also suggested that the continents may be plowed through the oceanic crust like a icebreaker breaking ice in a, over, in a uh, frozen over patch of ocean. But then you would expect to see the evidence of that, the broken chunks of crust being left behind, and there's no evidence of that. So unfortunately, Wegener's idea basically became a backwater of geological science. Um, the problem was is that he had a lot of good evidence, but he didn't have that important mechanism to figure out how does this work. And unfortunately for him, um, it was pretty much laughed off at that point. Um, a few people kept the idea around and kept it going for a period of time. Um, it wasn't until the 1950s that Wegener's ideas began to revive in modern science. And part of this has to do with the fact of um, a science called paleomagnetism, or a field of study called paleomagnetism. Paleomagnetism is looking at the magnetic uh, signature that is left in rocks by past magnetic fields of the earth. Now what it turns out is that if you take a rock, especially a molten rock, and you have it molten, you have iron bearing minerals in it, especially like magnetite, hematite, ilmenite, and these things are free to float in whatever direction they want. But because of the magnetic field of the earth, what they'll tend to do is line up with however the magnetic field of the Earth is aligned at that location. Now this works great for us because we know that the magnetic field of the Earth emanates from the South Pole, goes up, and comes back in at the North Pole. So at the poles, the magnetic field would be vertical. At the equator, the magnetic field is horizontal to the surface of the Earth. By measuring the angle of tilt of the magnetite minerals or magnetic minerals, we can figure out where on the earth from north to south that rock solidified at. Very, very powerful tool for us. Um, so this is ancient magnetism that gets recorded into the rocks. Now, one of the things that we started to do is measure this. And one of the things we found is that when you measure the ancient magnetic fields of the Earth, something weird happens. Um, one of the things, besides the fact that we find that every once in a while the North Pole and South Pole of the Earth in terms of the magnetic poles flips. It does this periodically. We still do not understand why this happens. We just know it happens and we've actually even built a model of the Earth uh, that even shows that it happens though we still don't understand why. But one of the things happens is if you plot where the North Pole should have been, assuming the continents would remain stationary over time, you end up with a divergent set of plots. 
for different locations on the earth. Now this doesn't make a lot of sense because now you're saying that, oh, a hundred million years ago, the earth had two magnetic pole, north poles. That's nonsensical. Physically, no magnet has two north poles. But if you move, allow the continents to move, then the field, the, the apparent location of the magnetic lines begins to become much more um, cohesive and overlapping. And it, some tr problem areas, but these have to do with the fact that the continents apparently can and do move at different rates at different times relative not only to themselves at the current present, but in the past as well. Now, um, this polar wander shows that we can really begin to think that, okay, something's happening with the continents. They appear to be moving. We still don't have a mechanism. This is basically another piece of evidence that goes with the evidence that Wegener had. Now, during the 1950s and 1960s, uh, there were some other things that were happening. Some technological advances were being made that allowed us to explore the Earth greater. One of which was the, de the development and widespread use of sonar by scientists. Sonar was developed um, basically towards the end of World War II. Uh, it was a military asset for a long period of time. But uh, basically it began to be used to map the bottom of the, of the ocean floors. And as they began to map the bottom of the ocean floors, they began to do other sampling and also they figured out a way that instead of needing to drill into the rocks and take samples of the rocks and maintain their orientations, etc., so you can do paleomagnetism, they began to be able to use sensors that could sense the general magnetic field of the oceans. And so what happened is the sonar data began to show that there were these topographic features within the oceans near areas like the Caribbean islands you had this deep trench in the middle of the Atlantic you had this huge mountain range that rose up um, the sampling began to show that when they were drilling in and trying to take samples that hey strangely enough if I'm really close to this mountain range the amount of sediment on the rocks is very little the further I go away from the mountain range, the thicker that sediment gets. And then the magnetic reversals. This was the kick, the, the, the clincher for some people. Magnetic reversals were mirrored across the oceanic ridge. So when you look at the ocean bottom, what you would see, if you could see the magnetic fields, is here would be the ridge and the pattern of the magnetic fields would m mirror itself across that. The only way you can explain this is that somehow materials being created at the ridge and moving apart slowly over time. Now in um, the 1960s Harry Hess proposed the idea of seafloor spreading. The idea that the sea floor was spreading apart because of these observations. In 1963 is when uh, doctors uh, Fred Vine and D. Matthews found the discovery of these magnetic strips, the magnetic reversals on either side. And this basically begins to tie everything together. Now this led to the the, the I don't want to say discovery, but the conclusion of a new paradigm which ended up being called plate tectonics. It basically takes the idea of continental drift, the idea of seafloor spreading, and marries the two together to say we can explain the motions of the continents and we can explain these features in the ocean by allowing the seafloor to move. And so basically the idea is that the outer surface of the earth is broken into these major plates. If you look in your book, um, you'll see an illustration similar to this that shows basically the major plates of the earth. There are seven primary large plates and then there are several smaller plates. These plates are capable of movement. Um, they sit 
on top of the athenosphere. Remember when we talked about the properties, uh, layers of the earth by property, the athenosphere is a weak sphere. It's partially molten and therefore it allows the surface, the lithosphere, which is the crust and the uppermost mantle, to physically partially separate from the earth, uh, from the rest of the earth and allow them to slide and jostle around on the planet. Um, this means that these several, the seven major plates, which are North America, South America, Pacific, Africa, Eurasia, Australia, and Antarctic, um, are able to move around. And then there are all the minor plates that are going. Now, here's the thing. All the plates are in motion relative to each other, which means that it's a little hard to and complex to look at because everything's in motion. So you have everything's changing and you have to pick a zero point. You have to pick a stationary point. Generally speaking in geology, we usually use um, Africa as a central point on the earth. And we say that Africa isn't moving. And part of this has to do with the fact that when we take measurements under Africa, the continent of Africa, the thermal gradient or the temperatures that we measure under Africa are much greater than other areas of the planet, which is an indicator that Africa isn't moving that fast. So we use Africa as our zero point. Um, the plates are also constantly changing shape and they are constantly changing size. Some plates are getting larger, some plates are getting smaller. Um, the largest plate of the current Earth is the Pacific Plate, make, uh, takes up almost half of the Earth. And then we have all the smaller plates. Now, the movement rates of the plates is pretty slow. On average, it's only about five centimeters a year, a little over two inches. Um, ultimately, this is driven by the unequal distribution of heat within the Earth. The core of the Earth is very hot. The outer edge of the Earth is a lot cooler. How does the heat want to get out? It wants to move through convection. Uh, convection is the motion of material due to heat. Hot material rises, cold material sinks. And at the surface, there's a, a bit of an overturned issue that happens. Um, if you go on to YouTube, or after this is done, type in on YouTube, look at uh, convecting magma lakes or convecting lava lakes. You can find some videos that show something similar to this, which may be very akin to what the early Earth looked like when plate tectonics first got started. Now, um, basically, the cooler, denser portions of the lithosphere are going to sink back into the Earth in what we call subduction zones. Um, you can think of it this way as the cooler material is being pushed down and sinks under the rest of the crust. Um, when we look at it, then, the distribution of earthquakes across the world, when we look at where they occur, m the vast majority, 99.5, 99.9% of all earthquakes are directly associated with a plate boundary in one way, shape, or form. So, not only do the plates uh, align with earthquakes, they also align with volcanoes, and they also align with the mountain ranges. So. We have a lot of other evidence that helps us understand that this is happening. Now, basically speaking, there are three types of plate boundaries. Uh, just to go over them as, as easily as possible, um, there are divergent, transform, and convergent boundaries. Divergent boundaries are basically what we find at the mid-oceanic ridges. This is where in the Earth, we believe we have material that is welling up, coming close to the surface and causing the surface to spread apart. Um, these boundaries basically, for the most part, tend to be underwater. They're the oceanic ridges, although there is at least one spot where the mid -ocean, where the, uh, the spreading ridge is above land in, for the Atlantic Ocean, and that is the island of Iceland. Um, we also have a spreading center developing in what is called the Great Rift Valley of East Africa. Um, that is not, a, not below water right now because of volcanics that have basically created dams that are holding the ocean water back right now. Um, 
basically speaking, the oceanic ridges are the longest topographic feature on the Earth. The crest of them rises up some two to three kilometers above the, the uh, rest of the ocean floor. They represent a whopping 20% of their surface, so it's the biggest single feature on the Earth. And it winds through all of the Earth's major ocean basins. Uh, in general, these systems can range anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000 kilometers in width. And they, have, they can have these deep central valleys called rift valleys in them, depending on how fast they're spreading. Um, but they're basically valleys that are bounded by what are called normal faults on either side. And they are created as the material pulls apart, new material fills in, and it pulls apart again. Um, this is where the seafloor spreading is occurring, so the new seafloor is being created there, which means that when we're in or near the mid-oceanic ridge, there is little to no sediment on top of the rocks. You're looking at naked igneous rocks that are forming in the bottom of the ocean. T again, typical rate of spread is about 5 centimeters or 2 inches a year. Um, interestingly enough, when we look at the ocean floor, the oldest ocean floor that we can find occurs near the Kamchatka Peninsula in the Pacific Ocean, it's only 180 million years old. So the material that makes up the ocean floors is relatively young in comparison to the age of the Earth at 4.56 billion years old. Now generally speaking when we look at these ridge systems, um, the way they look is going to be dependent on how fast they spread. Um, at slow spreading rates, which are usually considered to be one to five centimeters a year, they have a prominent rift valley that that uh, is usually going to be anywhere from 30 to 50 kilometers across, it can be between 1,500 and 3,000 meters deep, and the landscape tends to be rugged. At faster rates, what we call intermediate rates, where we're going between nine and fifteen, uh, nine and five centimeters a year, the rift valleys tend to become less less deep. They're shallower, uh, usually only about two hundred meters deep, and the topography in the area tends to be smoother. Um, this is in part due to the fact that the slower the rift is moving, the stronger the rocks become before they have to break, and therefore you get larger movements on in those rocks than you do in the faster moving systems. At spreading rates greater than nine centimeters a year, there doesn't tend to be a rift valley. It's spreading so fast that it's filling in. Um, usually, uh, the if we do get a, a valley area, uh, it'll be a depression usually about 10 kilometers wide. Um, it, it, the faulting is so extensive, it's, it's literally fault after fault after fault after fault. They're so close together that um, it, it really makes the area complex. Or we end up in a situation where we get what is called a Horst and Graben type of situation where instead of having a valley that has, here's a set of faults, here's a set of faults, here's a set of faults, we get Here's a set of faults like this, then there's another set over here like this, and another set over here like this. So we have these pieces where you have these pieces that are raised up like a ridge, which are called the horse, and we have these areas that are dropped down, which are called the grobbins. Um, we see this also in areas of what we call continental rifts. This is where Basically, there's been an attempt by the Earth to open up one of these spreading centers on land. Again, looking at the, East a the Great Rift Valley of East Africa, or um, the Rhine Valley of North Europe, or more locally, the Rio Grande Rift Valley in uh, Texas and New Mexico, though that one is right now technically considered a failed Rift Valley because it seems that the, a lot of the motion there has come to an end. Now the second one we'll discuss are the convergent plate boundaries. This is where two plates are coming together and one plate is going under the other. Basically when we look at this we can have three different types of convergent boundaries. We can have ocean material to ocean material. That is simple enough. This is where oceanic material is meeting up and plunging under um, 
other oceanic material. Usually in this case what you'll see is that the younger material is what's staying on top and older material is what's staying on the bottom. Now the area where we actually see this plunge is called the oceanic trench and these trenches tend to be thousands of kilometers long. They also tend to be anywhere from 8 to 12 kilometers deep and they can be anywhere from 50 to 100 kilometers wide. Uh, we also call them subduction zones and the interesting thing about them is that we can actually tell a lot about the under uh, the underdiving plate based on the distribution of earthquakes within these zones as we will eventually see I believe in chapter 9. Um, on average though the subducting crust goes down at about 45 degrees below the horizontal. Now they have some of the same basic characteristics, but they can be highly differentiated when you start looking at specifics. Um, but if we look at the three different types, the first again being ocean to ocean, you have denser oceanic slabs sinking under lighter oceanic slabs. Basically what this will do is this will generally create what we call a volcanic island arc. As the material is being subducted, one of the things it carries is water. Water helps to lower the melting point of rocks because water is the universal solvent. And then we see volcanic activity above the, the area where the rocks are melting. Um, these volcanoes can tend to be anywhere from intermediate to mafic uh, or intermediate to felsic in, in uh, composition. Occasionally you see some mafic material, but not terribly often. Um, the interesting thing about volcanic island arcs is you can age the volcanic arc and, and age the subduction zone by the number of volcanoes. For example, if you look at the Caribbean Ocean, where the Caribbean islands are, especially the Lesser Antilles, most of those islands there tend to be an island that has one or two volcanic vents on them, or one or two volcanoes on them. Compare that to Japan. The islands of Japan, the major islands of Japan, are literally made up of hundreds of volcanoes that have grown together. Now, not all those volcanoes are active. In fact, many of them are extinct. But it just goes to show that, you know, the islands of Japan have been there. The subduction zone for Japan has been there much, much longer than the subduction zone in the Caribbean island has been there. Um, the second type of ocean of uh, subduction zone we can get is what we call oceanic to continental. This is where you have oceanic material subducting under continental material. Now, continental material being much thicker and uh, and less dense than the oceanic material is much less likely to subduct. So, just for illustration, it'd be like this book here. And this would be the, the, crust, the oceanic crust subducting under. The lighter, thicker continental crust is going to stay on apart. The front end of it might buckle a little bit. Um, we'll also see a feature along the leading edge of it here where this is going down like this. You can almost think of the overriding continent as a razor blade. Um, everybody's had this happen if you've used a razor blade at any point in time whether it's ladies you're shaving your legs guys you're shaving your face or hand or back or chest or legs or if you were a swimmer um, you have an imperfection whether it is a pimple an ingrown hair maybe just a mole or a little bump on the skin doesn't matter what you run the razor over it. what happens you slice something off that you're bleeding um, the subducting oceanic material under going under the continental material can do the same thing. So like my Fitbit here, here's the continent, here's the ocean, goes through, you see how my Fitbit is getting pulled, is hanging up on the ocean. Now if I was to do this hard enough, eventually the band would break if this was an actual continent, uh, continent oceanic collision. What would happen is the Fitbit would then be plastered onto the edge of the continent in what we call the accretionary wedge. Um, the accretionary wedge is going to pick up bits of sediment, it's going to pick up uh, volcanic islands, it's going to pick up uh, undersea volcanoes or, or sea mounts or um, 
Goyots, which are volcanoes that what used to be volcanic islands that have now sunk. Um, it's going to pick up, it might even gouge out chunks of the ocean lithosphere. Um, but it also is going to cause that buckling at the, and that's going to cause to some degree the buckling in along the edge of the continent. So that's going to create some of the mountain ranges that are, that we see such as the Andes Mountains in South America, the Cascades in, uh, that range from California up through British Columbia. Um, the Sierra Nevada to a degree was formed by that way, but you also are going to get this volcanic activity again, but this time instead of being a volcanic island arc, it's going to be a volcanic, a continental volcanic arc. Uh, they're basically volcanoes within the edge of the continent, but again, they're going to be directly related to these subduction zones. The last type of convergence is the inevitable um, ending of a oceanic to continental collision because sooner or later somewhere out there it's going to be another continent so now instead of one thing going under another you've got basically two continents that clash and collide uh, one is going to partially go under the other but it can't go far uh, the classic example of this right now in the world is india the subcontinent of india has hit asia and has actually been subducted more or less about 2,000 kilometers under Asia. This has basically thickened a, the crust under Asia by double the amount that it used to be. It is what has pushed up the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalaya Mountains. Um, we also believe the Alps, the Urals, and the uh, Appalachians were were created by this, but the, uh, those other mountain ranges were much older collisions events that have happened. In fact, the Appalachians, we believe, occurred when uh, Pangaea actually formed. In fact, uh, technically, when we look at the information on the rocks, uh, some of the land that's under what is now New York uh, used to be part of Europe. So when Pangaea split, so did part of Europe. And in fact, it was actually part of Britain. So kind of foreshadowing of history, if you will. But basically, um, the two continents will collide and they will weld together. So you start out with an oceanic to continental collision. But here comes this continental piece coming in. It hits. It gets pushed under. Things get radically, radically messed up. Uh, the technical term that one of my uh, one of the grad students I had when I was undergrad was hosed, um, but basically it's just everything gets mushed up. Uh, you've got volcanics, you've got metamorphic rocks, you've got sedimentary rocks, you've got stuff that used to be on the ocean floor that's now thrown tens of thousands of feet into the air under the top of mountains. It's just a really messy process. Uh, in fact. India is still hitting Asia today. Um, the Himalaya Mountains are still rising. They're still getting taller. Um, this will probably go on for some time to come, uh, probably even millions of years still to go. The third type of boundary is what we call a transform boundary. Now, the uh, divergent boundary is a boundary that creates material. The convergent boundary is a boundary that destroys material. The transform boundary does neither. The transform boundary occurs mostly near um, near the spreading ridges uh, and they, if they occur because this, the earth is a sphere. The segments of the mid-oceanic ridge system wants to try to be straight but the earth is a sphere. You can't Put that sort of nice straight on a sphere easily so what happens is you get broken segments and what can happen uh, to try to illustrate this is you might end up with something like this and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two books together here uh, I want these two books to illustrate different parts of different segments so we have something like this okay and let's just say that we have, what we have going on here is the spreading ridge is offset. On the top one, the spreading ridge is in this hand. On the bottom one, the spreading ridge is this hand. 
which means that this material is going to slide past each other somewhat like this. Okay, so that would be a transform boundary. It's just material sliding past each other. Uh, the best known transform boundary in the world is a little fault called the San Andreas Fault. If you stand straddling the fault system, if you stand facing north, your right leg will be on what is called the North American plate. Your left leg would be on the Pacific plate. And the way that motion is working is the Pacific plate is basically going northwards in relationship to the uh, North American plate. So basically uh, we have a situation where San Francisco is on the north is on the eastern side of that fault um, and uh, LA is on the s southern side of that fault or western side of that fault kind of goes off northeast so uh, northwest um, but basically over time the those two cities are getting closer together now we have all sorts of evidence for testing of plate tectonics and coming up with how is this real, is this not real. Um, we've done all sorts of things. I've talked a little bit already. We've taken samples from the ocean floor and we see that, well, from the mid-oceanic ridge to the trenches, sediment layers get thicker and thicker and thicker. Um, our rocks get older and older if we look at their radiometric age dating. Uh, we also see that the um, that uh, we get something called hot spots, which really help us out with this. Um, a hot spot is defined as a long-lived, deep origin mantle upwelling. Um, it may actually be coming from the boundary of the crust, I mean not the crust, the boundary of the mantle and the core. Um, Basically, you can think of it sort of like a blowtorch coming up. Um, you know, if this is the core mantle boundary, here's this hot plume of material coming up, and then we have the crust coming through, and it burns a hole through the crust and then creates a volcano on top of that. Uh, best example of this is Hawaii and all the Hawaiian Islands. In fact, if you look at Hawaii and the Hawaiian Islands, it turns out that the youngest island we can see is the island of Hawaii. The oldest island in the chain is, um, oh shoot, I just lost the name in my head. Let's see if I can find it. Of course, it doesn't help if I'm changing books back and forth either. Uh, I'm not finding it, but uh, yeah, there it is actually. Kauai is actually old. So if we look at the, the age of the rocks on the Hawaiian Islands, we find that Hawaii ranges from 0.7 million years old to the present, whereas Maui is a little less than a million years. Uh, Moa Kea is between 1.3 and 1.8 million years. Oahu is 2.2 .2 to 3.3 million years and Kauai is 3.8 to 5.6 million years. And Hawaii is not the youngest of the islands. Well, technically it's not the youngest of the volcanoes. Um, there is another potential island out there. It's called Luihi. Luihi is a submarine volcano. It is basically to the southeast of the main island of Hawaii. Uh, it is still some 10,000 feet below sea level it's going to be a good 20,000 years or so before it permanently comes up above sea level for any length of time. That doesn't mean that people aren't out there already selling land for it. Go figure. But um, if we look at the sea floor in the Pacific, let's see if I can show you this, we have the Hawaiian Islands that come out here and they come out to what's called Midway Island and then there's this jog in this line of features that then goes northwards up towards the Kamchatka Peninsula of, si of uh, Siberia. From uh, Midway Island nor northwards, that is called the Emperor Seamount Chain. They're all 
very similar chemically. Um, that material is coming from a single source. It's a hot spot. It's burning through, creates a volcano, then it moves over, new volcano pops up, and it just keeps moving. Um, hot spots are very useful for helping us measure plate tectonics because what we can do is measure the age of the rocks from one location to another. The difference in age and the, divided by the difference in distance gives uh, will let us know what how fast those rocks are or how fast the area is moving. I should say the difference in distance divided by the distance in age would tell us how fast those rocks are moving or how fast the crust is moving through that area. Other ways of measuring it that we've seen, um, <clears throat> we have seen besides that the paleomagnetism, of course. Um, GPS is actually being used now to measure the locations of features and how fast they're moving. Uh, we can, that's how we actually know how fast the Himalayas are rising. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands are basically moving towards Japan about four inches every year. Um, we also show that um, through things called uh, very long baseline interferometry, which has uh, some very interesting applications, but basically it's a way of being able to measure things um, using interference uh, of, of wave energy. And then uh, we actually have <clears throat> observatories that are so powerful now that they can actually observe the motion of the plate under them while they're trying to look at the stars. Now, when Wegener came up with his idea, he had no mechanism to how to drive things. Um, Hess's idea with the seafloor spreading is that the upper part of the earth, the plates are kind of moving like conveyor belts. Imagine the oceans are moving like conveyor belts and the continents are along for the ride. What's moving the conveyor belt? Well, that's where we start getting divided. There are a couple of different camps on this. Um, we uh, do agree in general in geology that there is this convective flow of material within at least the upper 29 within the 2900 kilometer thick mantle um, and we believe that this is in part driving plate tectonics uh, mantle convection is actually something that we have recently been able to actually demonstrate within uh, some uh, sensing techniques where we can actually detect the movement of materials within the mantle so we're beginning to actually be able to map those areas out but it's still slow. Uh, there's some other things that are going to play a part into this. Um, some people have proposed the idea of what we call slab pull. And this is the idea that the material that is subducted down is so cold and heavy that it's pulling down on the rest of the plate. We have the idea of ridge push. Uh, because the material is upwelling at the, mant at the spreading ridges, this pushes the ridges up, so this pushes them up. Gravity is trying to push them back down. Um, realistically speaking, ridge push is probably slightly smaller than slab pull, but to be honest, um, both forces are going to be playing a part. Uh, I don't think you can make the argument that one is more important than the other, realistically speaking. Not until we have a greater sense of all the mechanics that are going on within the Earth. and That's going to be a long time off until we can really get a good sense of mapping of what the interior material of the earth is actually physically doing. <clears throat> um, part of this is because we don't know how subduction is occurring within the mantle. Uh, we don't know if it's what we call the zonal, subduction, zonal uh, convection, meaning that only a portion of the mantle is convecting or it's, it's convecting in different layers. Or is it the whole mantle convecting? Is it some combination thereof? You know what's going on um, but you know plate tectonics regardless is very very important to us it basically is the unifying principle in geology plate tectonics is to geology what evolution is to biology it, you just do not have a good fundamental science without that underpinning um, it's the framework of tech of plate tectonics that gives us 
the explanation for earthquakes, for volcanoes, for mountain ranges. It helps us understand the distribution of plants and animals in the past as well as rocks and climate, climatic evidence. Um, it's not completely understood, but it definitely is the underlying, underlying model for the Earth's dynamic processes. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop here for this one. That's chapter two. Like I said, I'll try to get these uh, outlines up on the net at, probably on Monday, but you have this now to go off of for uh, Wednesday, the 31st of August, and I'll see you guys back in class later on.